All right, so we are now recording and uh, just a reminder again, my name is Natalie and I am the librarian at our Souk branch. And I just wanted to begin by acknowledging that uh, I am currently coming to you from the lands of the Coast Salish people, specifically Souk Nation. I'm also really grateful to work um, on Pachidat Nation and I live on Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, all of whose relationships with the land continue to this day. And um, so today we have author Hayden Stone coming with us. And uh, he is a uh, queer fiction writer, especially fiction with a lot of kissing. Uh, he currently lives in Victoria, but has previously lived in Vancouver and London, England. He knows which is the business end of a trowel, the horror of the wrong kind of leaves on the track, delaying trains, and a little bit about ancient ruins. Hayden likes strong coffee and is owned by two cats. Um, and so just for some housekeeping today, Hayden's going to be doing a, a reading of an excerpt from his book, An Unexpected Kind of Love, which you can get from our library through our Overdrive or Libby apps. And um, yeah, this is just showing on screen now. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So that one, um, there are holds for it right now, and hopefully we will be getting the print copy in the nearest future. So if you're interested in that, you can go to our library website, virl.bc.ca, and then search for uh, an unexpected kind of love. So we'll be doing the reading, and then uh, Hayden and I will be doing a Q&A with some questions I've prepared in advance. And then at the end, we'll stop the recording, and um, participants can have a chance to ask questions directly. All right, so Hayden, are you ready for your first question? I'm as ready as it gets. Okay. <laughs> Born ready. <laughs> All right, so uh, an easy one to start out with. What was your inspiration for writing the book or what sparked you to want to write this book? You know, I was trying to think on this question because it's a question I've I've had it before, and there's a couple of different, um, I guess, answers. The first is um, Notting Hill, the film, um, because I'm a bit of a sucker for, you know, really cheesy kind of 90s um, movies, which is sort of a carryover from cheesy 80s movies like John Hughes films and things. So um, anyway, Notting Hill, the sort of the premise of a bookshop in London really captured my imagination because I love bookshops and I've lived in London and I could just see this, but I wanted it to be queer. You know, that was the twist. And that's about where the similarities end, that there's an actor, an American actor, and uh, English bookseller, and then it's its own story. But I thought, oh, like, isn't that an interesting idea just to make that queer and um, in a setting that um, I know. So th that was something I wanted to explore and off I went. Very nice. I am. Um, my colleague was first was the first one to tell me about your book. And as soon as I heard Notting Hill, I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. Um, all right. So you have lived abroad before and have likely shared some of the same or some memories in the same spots as Aubrey, the main character. Did you find that nostalgia informed your writing process at all? Or did you find that the story transported you back to your time in England? It's probably a bit of both, you know, because, um, you know, definitely I wanted the settings to kind of be like their own character in the story that readers would really feel that, especially like Aubrey's um, bookshop and, you know, locations around and and make it seem and feel real. So I think I've been to just about all of the settings in the story. Um, maybe. Um, however, they're not based on actual places, like that's all fiction. But I could just imagine like the setting, like his bookshop there, because um, Soho in particular has, of course, quite a history and also used to have um, quite a few bookshops once upon a time. So I thought, oh, that would be an interesting um, place to to set this story and also has a connection to queer London, of course. So I thought that would be a, a fun setting. All right, so, um, and I, I agree, like I, uh, it's been a very long time since I've been to London, but um, it definitely has a way of transporting you back into that space or even just thinking of like 
um, the friendships and the nightlife glimpses we get as well. That was really fun part of the story. Um, all right, so uh, speaking of the setting you were just mentioning, setting is of course a driving force for a lot of readers and um, Opry's bookshops surely invokes a special coziness for readers, um, particularly those who frequent libraries, I think. Um, what, importance, what importance did the setting play in your storytelling and do you have any fond memories of uh, cozy bookshops or libraries? I know um, you're describing the setting as like almost like an extra character. Do you want to speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, I've got a couple of things to say. I mean, first, like to start with libraries, because libraries, right? Um, I definitely um, owe a lot of gratitude and have warm feelings for libraries, because that was sort of my my place growing up. And I grew up in um, Surrey. And so the Surrey Public Library um, was always felt like a home to me. Right. So there is that certain comfort always with books and um, like, and in terms of used bookshops, I mean, there are definitely um, a couple that I remember that really sort of sort of stand out. I mean, if you've been in Vancouver, um, there's um, like McLeod Books, if you've ever been there, it's it's literally a rabbit warren of books. And who knows, probably it's been there for decades some of those books could have been sitting on the same shelves for decades. It's something that you would not see anywhere else. Does it meet health and safety standards? I don't know, but I kind of love it. And um, there was a bookshop and oh, I wish I could remember the name in Edinburgh that I saw that is again, amazing. It sort of has like a secret back room of books and um, it's all very characterful. And of course, living in Victoria, I'd have to mention like the old Russell books was also quite, amazing with all the different, um, um, I guess, shop parts and locations and floors. And, and now, of course, they've moved to a central um, location, which is uh, very modern. But I, I also have a bit of nostalgia for that old bookshop, you know, again, years of just being in the same place and books everywhere, books stacked in front of shelves. And I imagine Aubrey shop to be kind of like that so, you know just you know has this family history and that um it was you know a place for him that's also home and uh, it's, it's also this literal home above the bookshop but I mean just being in the shop space itself is home yeah I as I was reading that especially the beginning part of the book um I just found there were so many parallels of, of course, being a librarian working in libraries. And um, I just, yeah, there's a scene where uh, Aubrey, the main character, is in a little bit of a tizzy because books are being out of order and, um, and, and people asking for books based on covers or the color. And that is definitely just something we see in libraries and I'm sure in tons of bookshops as well. And um, yeah, it was just like a really nice little quirk being uh, somebody who works in libraries, seeing that um, written down. Yeah, right. I've, I've worked um, in retail um, for sure, not in a bookshop, but the customer questions can be amazing. Like you get some good ones and then you get some wild ones. And I, one of my beta readers is also a, um, uh, English um, bookseller and so uh, he's like yes rings true <laughs> so um, yes that was definitely yeah uh, customer service experience yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right um, so it seems like some of the characters particularly Aubrey um, are still discovering themselves do you find that you ever disagreed with decisions the characters made um, and if so, did you find that difficult to write or was it um, nice to just have like a complete separation of you as the writer and the character development? Hmm. Uh, it's, yeah, like Aubrey is definitely not like a self insert, but it's easier for me writing him because he's an introvert 
than Blake because he's an extrovert and um, and you're also in um, Aubrey's head and you can sort of see the decision making or thought process there. So the reader is is there with him and figuring it out. Blake is more of a mystery because you're not in his head. You don't get the second point of view. So you're only seeing things through Aubrey's viewpoint. So of course it's biased. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it was probably more challenging writing Blake and then some of the decisions, which I think were quite human, especially in Blake's part where he's very conflicted. Um, and I don't want to spoil the book or anything, but you know, there's one scene in particular that um, you know, some folks have asked like, oh, like, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it's like, it's that thing where people sometimes do things which rationally, logically, they probably wouldn't do, but emotionally in the spur of the moment, they might deny reality and just go with something with the gut. So, yeah. So that was, yeah, probably more challenging, yeah, writing some of Blake's scenes and having Blake off the page and giving the reader enough I find um, as a reader, it's really nice to read books with flawed characters too, and um, people trying to make decisions and maybe maybe it's like a challenging decision and they're going to look back on later or something like that. I ju it just makes it more like a, an authentic reading experience as well. Um, so I discovered very early on in reading your book, that it is very sexy. And when I was thinking, oh, Notting Hill retelling, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a very cute, quirky romance, which it definitely is. Um, but yeah, it's, it gets very steamy. So I was wondering uh, what your writing experience was like, writing more of like the dialogue um, aspects of the book versus the steamier scenes. And um, if you have any tips for people who are writing romance or just writing in general, like what's a um do you have any tips for people trying to approach writing sex scenes or anything that maybe there's like a vulnerability aspect to it yeah absolutely um being vulnerable I mean that is it and I think that is it starts with building character from the beginning because there needs to be some sort of connection with the reader before you go into those kinds of scenes and I will say a number of years ago, I attended the um, Surrey International Writers Festival, which was great. And um, Diana Galvedon, um, who has the Out Outlander series, which is also quite, you know, spicy. Um, she was giving a workshop on basically sexy writing. And I attended this master class for a couple of hours, because I was curious to hear what her insights were from someone who's obviously been very successful. Um, and basically her point is the same point that I probably make about almost any, any kind of scene, which is uh, you need to have that emotion. You need to have that emotional connection um, with the reader. Um, and it's not about, you know, parts or, you know, um, um, being, graphic I mean books can be like all kinds of heat levels and romance they call them you know from zero which is totally sweet romance there's nothing on the page um, to very high heat levels and though mine isn't the highest it's up there um, and yeah and I guess that was a choice partly because of you know um, just the way the story is uh, the publishing but I also wanted like those scenes are developing character so basically every scene that you are writing whether it's a sexy scene or not needs to somehow deepen like deepen the story um, you know develop your character or you know somehow forward the plot so my, my general writing advice would be for people just to read a lot that's the first thing you can do as a writer is read a lot, uh, read in your genres. If you want to write romance or mysteries or whatever it is you want to write, read lots of them. Um, and I also really recommend reading outside of your genre. And I would even go as far to say, read other forms of writing if you're into it and try writing other forms of writing because it really builds your chops as a writer. Even if you never sees the light of day, you know, it's just like an exercise for you to try. Believe me, these things have a way of sort of seeping into your writing after and you think, oh, so 
you know, try writing poetry. Like for me, it taught me to be a lot more concise, you know, and that you can convey a lot of meaning and emotion in just a line. So the way that you structure something. The other thing um, I would say is that um, find, um, you know, people to support your writing, find your writing community. There's lots of ways to do that, like writing groups, critique partners, there's online, there's in person. I know it's harder now with COVID, but there's still lots of resources online and get feedback on your writing and never take one person's opinion as fact, because this whole gig is very subjective. But if you are getting a bunch of feedback that are, people are stuck on a certain scene and they might be saying different things, but everybody's pointing, oh, this scene, like something is off. That means that tells me something is off and I need to go back there and figure out what that is. So, and, and having more than one person definitely helps you um, yeah, reading and giving feedback. So reach, find your community. Cause like writing, you know, it's fun, you know, the way I got into it actually it was NaNoWriMo into writing novels, right? Which is great for community and fun, low pressure. And remember like writing your first draft, it's it's going to be rough. Everybody's first draft is rough. Mine is rough. I went through, I don't know how many drafts before it goes to my publisher. And then it goes through a whole bunch more drafts, rounds of edits. And so basically long story short, there are a lot of drafts that happen from the first draft to what you are reading and a lot of people involved at the publisher too to help bring the book to life so yeah i guess just be kind to yourself and be brave and just face the page yeah face the page that's great um i think as well like of course i was mentioning the more like sexy scenes but there's uh beyond the like spice rating or wh whatever it was called um there's so much intimacy in the author and reader experience. Like you can have something that just speaks so um, like emotionally to you beyond it being something about sex as well. So um, yeah, I, I think you do a really great job at um, developing that relationship. Um, all right, this is a, kind of a tie into that question. So we have many artists and um, writers on Vancouver Island. It's the most I've seen anywhere I've lived. Uh, so do you have any advice to people who uh, are trying to write their first book? You, you were mentioning going to workshops. Um, I was also interested in knowing if you have any advice specifically for queer creators, if there's certain spaces that you found were um, championing your uh, writing or your work. Um, yeah, if you have anything to share, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So yeah, Vancouver Island does have an amazing and Gulf Islands, amazing artist and writer population. I don't know what it is per capita, but it's impressive. And I mean, we have uh, like two pubs named after like or inspired by writers alone in downtown Victoria. Um, and I guess another place that's very writer friendly is uh, Edinburgh um, as well. But um, yes, locally, like there's definitely writers groups. Uh, when NaNoWriMo happens in November, which is not that long um, from now, um, believe it or not, scary six weeks. Um, there are lots of NaNoWriMo prep groups, so you can reach out online. Locally, um, there are different communities to reach out for. They have different um, flavors. I mean, things from meetup to other groups, but specifically to speak to queer, finding supports queer writers, I think now more than ever is a great time to be a queer writer um, and that there are far more resources than there ever have been before, more queer writers writing across different genres. And it's really exciting to see that going mainstream. Um, young adult fiction has certainly led the way, but it's definitely becoming much more mainstream in adult fiction. And I'm really excited by that. And, and that also makes it, I think, easier for writers to, to work on that. And I really, for queer writers, I really recommend finding other um, queer writers as critique partners because they really understand um, 
some of the challenges in the community and and um, what they what they face, you know, um, and that what's happening in your story also like rings true to the experience. Um, so yeah, and sometimes I'm sure that you could probably start a writing group of your own, like um, if you're a queer writer and probably around NaNoWriMo is a great time, you know, with events. Um, they have community forums too that you could say I'm looking for other queer writers in like Vancouver Island. Are there any others out there looking to connect? And you could probably connect online to start. And that was where I found my first um, batch of, I guess, critique partners. And some of them are still critique partners and I love their feedback and in, in a queer writing group. And um, they, you know, as, as you build your relationship, if you have regular people that you are um, critiquing their work and they're giving you yours, it should be, you know, mutually encouraging and respectful and um, kind, really, you know, it's tough enough out there. And really, you just need to be, it's, it's always a big vulnerability sharing your work, but that's where you do the most uh, growth. So... Yeah, go out there and find the others. <laughs> Good. And um, in Souk, at least, we have uh, a, a writing group that actually meets at our library. Um, not currently, just because of the pandemic, but um, Souk Writers Collective is really great if you live locally. And um, if anybody is watching or listening to this and you're looking for um, a group to connect with, like Hayden was mentioning, there's lots of places online i i think even like reddit i have a friend who is an author and um he uses reddit a lot and um but yeah even just connecting with your library branch and asking them for advice i think that's a great idea that's a good one um yeah and um like i said also around like nanowrimo and meetup i know in victoria is quite big um for other places and yeah check out i guess other like your local libraries like you're suggesting and and see what's happening because they would know if they're hosting groups like i actually used to host a writing group that was a sort of a spin-off of a nano group like hosting a, a writing night um and there were a lot of actual queer writers in that group too and it wasn't a queer writing group per se but um, it was great because then you can connect and, um, you know, find people. But yeah, go going to the library is a good, good spot. Yeah. Um, and like you were mentioning, it's hard to believe uh, November is so soon. And um, yeah, I know so many people participate in and out and NaNoWriMo. Oh my gosh, what an acronym. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, you previously mentioned to me um, other stories living in the same universe. Can you by any chance give us a sneak peek um, on what these stories might look like? Or can you share anything you might be working on for the future? It's okay if it's too soon. For I, that. <laughs> I can be, let's see how coy can I be. There may be another story set in the same story world with this, as a standalone um, coming up soon. And I would say if you follow me on my social media, I'm on Twitter and Instagram mainly, um, there will be some book news very soon. <laughs> um, how soon? Probably before NaNoWriMo, that's for sure. I would say even before, where are we? I would argue maybe even before the end of the month. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, wow, good to know. I was not expecting it to be that soon. That's great. Um, all right, so uh, if you are able to, we'll do um, your reading and I'm just going to uh, unpin myself and um, then afterwards we'll have some questions from participants. Okay, great. And let me know if um, you can't hear me or anything like that, or if the sound is off. So hopefully I'm not gonna be blocking the mic because that would be terrible. So um, I'm reading, of course, from, can, can you see it? I'm blurred. Anyway, that's not a very good shot. There it is. Um, and, I'm just starting with chapter one. I was trying to think where is the best place to start. And I will tie back into what um, Natalie was saying with um, the setting in the bookshop and an introduction to Aubrey. So um, here's chapter one. There are two kinds of people in the world, people who put things away as they should and arseholes who shelve books with no respect for the alphabet. 
I hold the two, yes, two, misfiled copies of Pride and Prejudice. What sort of heathen would put Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice all the way across the shop with the thrillers? The other copy had been over in comedy. I'm a tolerant man, but only some sort of twisted individual would go that far. Like I don't have enough to do to keep my Soho bookshop afloat without some rogue bookshelving action to muck up my inventory. The other day, I found Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray shelved with Mill Millington's Things My Girlfriend and I Have Argued About. Before that, Bronte's Wuthering Heights was caught canoodling with Gavaldon's Outlander in the G section. It's vandalism, pure and simple. The last customer for the evening left five minutes ago. The radio's on, playing the Arctic Monkeys as I put the shop to bed for the night. I head over to romance, Jane Austen in tow. Along the way, I had eaten up a stray stack of bestsellers on the front table. Each book has a place, and that place follows the rules of the alphabet. Most people have some passing familiarity with the alphabet before they start school, and A is the first letter they should learn if they paid any attention at all as a four-year-old. As I shelve the wayward books, I spot Madeline Miller's The Song of Achilles in Romance when it ought to be in general fiction. Oh, for the love of getting worked up again, or still. My only employee, Gemma, leans across the counter, amused, rubbernecking shamelessly at the scene of the crime. She's curvy, something decadent. She's in a lightweight silver blouse over her skirt, the hot day having shifted into evening. She's ready to go out once we close, something I won't be doing tonight. There was a time, not that long ago, when my Friday nights were spent out. Now, that time's better spent working and not thinking about the past, or the future for that matter, as in there'll be no future if my shop goes belly up. Behind Gemma, built-in oak bookcases with classics and collectible editions reach nearly to the tall ceiling. Light spills into the front of the bookshop from the street lamps. She snaps her gum because she knows that'll drive me mad. One day, I think she's expecting my brain to literally melt out of my ears. One day, it might actually happen. What did I say about snapping gum? It's seriously annoying. She waves a hand. Loosen up, Obs. You're the youngest grumpy old man I've ever met. You might look cool with the piercings and the band t-shirts, but to be honest, I worry about you. I stand up to my full height, which can be imposing, I'm told, for someone not quite hitting six feet. It's Aubrey. Not Obs. How many times have I told you? She laughs, unrepentant as she peers at me from beneath a blunt cut dark fringe. That's brilliant on your dating profile. Or grinder. Mr. Aubrey, how many times have I told you? Barnes. We look at each other across the shop. Or more accurate, accurately, I glare at her. Thankfully, there are no customers present to witness my daily mortifications by a uni student barely younger than me who loves to mop up the floor with my pride. The truth is, we met in a book club a couple of years back and we became fast friends. She gave hilarious reviews, which turned out to be handy for the shop. She thought I was delightfully quirky. It would have been the perfect spring romance, except I'm attracted to men and I was together with my ex. At any rate, we've got the banter down, especially now that I rely on her help in the shop. Customers love her too. She pretends to reconsider. Or how about Aubrey Barnes, fierce defender of books? That's got a superhero thing going on. More sympathetic, I think. Am I right or am I right? Gemma gives an impish smile. Once upon a time, I was just Aubrey Barnes, ready to go for pints or a gig or the occasional big night out, back before life became too real. Now I'm 23, going on 43. I sigh, noting the untied lace on one of my docks. I bend to fix it. You're here as the weekend help, remember? And to give solid dating advice too, value added, you really ought to pay me extra for that, she grins. Gemma dates like it's an unofficial Olympic sport. She has a, also has a habit of telling me all the gruesome details, no matter how much I protest that I'm her boss and I really don't need to know those things. She says it's for my own good. Heckling is a bonus feature, I take it. Resigned, I cross the shop to file the Song of Achilles in the right section. You can thank me another time, Gemma at last straightens, adjusting her messy bun. So am I done for the day yet? I'm going dancing after work. 
I check my watch amid my stack of black and brown leather bracelets. The watch is proper vintage aviator style with a black dial and white numbers complete with a rich leather brown strap. Beautiful and a glum reminder, not just of the passage of time, which at 23 years old, I'm still getting used to, or even worse, it's a reminder of Eli and last, birth, last year's birthday gift. To be honest, I should put, put it away or give it away, but he knows my taste so well. Besides, it really is a brilliant watch. It's not the watch's fault that he gave it to me. Obs. Yeah, sorry. Right. Go on then. I'll flip the sign in a minute. Studying me for a moment, she nods. Cheers. Gemma heads off into the back to gather her things. I go to the shop front and switch the sign over to closed and lock the door. It's late enough that even the Friday night book browsers have moved on to other things. The beauty of owning a shop is that I set the hours and the rules, so the truth is that I'm no enforcer, and Gemma and everyone else in London knows it. I head into the back, into the small kitchen to put the kettle on. The kettle sits on the old pine sideboard, which has been there since approximately forever. There's no dancing for me, not my usual scene these days. I'd much rather stay in and enjoy some of the classic introverted activities, like hiding and reading, Classical literature, art books, tawdry smut. I'm game for anything to stop my relentless brain doing time trial relays inside my skull. Maybe I'll start with one of the trade-ins that was brought in today. While I wait for the tea to steep, Gemma pokes her head into the pocket-sized kitchen. She's wearing the most mini of spray on mini skirts and some vague suggestion of a blouse, a sheer black number over a halter top. She's put on makeup for the night out, including an enviable shade of lipstick. And I thought she'd been dressed up to go out before my eyebrows lift. What? You're telling me that you were never part of the mesh shirt and thong set dancing on a speaker? Gemma asks archly. I open my mouth and blush something furious. What a horrifying vision. Oh no. God no. Please no. She giggles, obviously pleased with my reaction. You sure you don't want to come out with us tonight? Never. The idea of a dance floor with two close writhing bodies, strangers, sweat, and too much brash sexuality in my face is something I'm definitely not up for. Not even with Gemma. Probably not even in my first year of uni. I once went to clubs to their dazzle and bright, sticky floors and even stickier booths for overpriced drinks, although never in a mesh shirt, thank God. Even Eli's influence couldn't lure me that far, not his or anyone else's. Gemma gives me a wry smile. Maybe the pub another night? We haven't done that in a while. Maybe, I concede, pouring the tea. Have fun. And remember, I need you in at noon tomorrow. I'll be here, sober even. Thank heavens for small mercies. She grins, something dazzling that will work, doubtless work on most people, probably anyone other than me. Blowing a kiss, she heads out, and I lock the door after her. Taking my tea, I head up the stairs at the back to the bedsit over the shop. It's crammed with books, usually serving as the extra stock room in office, but now it's home. The walls are painted midnight blue, or at least what can be seen of them when they're not covered by books and bookcases or prints left by three generations of Barneses before me that worked here. I once had a proper home, a flat. Well, Eli and I had a flat together. Now it's Eli's flat with his live-in boyfriend. I better not start the dreary cycle of thoughts on what they could be doing on a Friday night together in our old home. These days, I literally live and breathe books by living in the shop. The good thing about this new arrangement is that there's no shortage of things to read. So I flop onto the leather sofa jammed between two bookcases under the window. Floor to ceiling shelving wraps around the room, heaving with books. Since there's no more room on the shelves, books are stacked in neat piles in front of them. The low coffee table is full of books too. A small desk in the corner has my laptop with the shop files and a wooden crate beneath it is filled with note notebooks of half written poems, a couple of sketchbooks and art supplies. My cat sleeps on the desk chair on top of the accounts book. In the corner, another sofa lies converted into my bed. As far as sofa beds go, it's moderately comfortable. Mom's been too ill the last couple of years to work. She signed over at the shop to me last year. Now it's just down to me to run everything. I should catch up on the bookkeeping tonight, but I don't have the willpower to go through such things. The result is always the same. 
never enough income. Our family business is fading. People want water stones or the independent mega shop foils down the street, or even the actual Barnes and Noble over in America. If only I'd taken business classes instead of literature. If I had, I might be in better shape or know what to do to turn things around. Instead, I'll muddle on and hope for the best, for some miracle that I can tell mom without it being a lie, that everything's fine, that we'll be all right, that I'll be all right. So I think I'm gonna just skip a couple of pages ahead to where they meet. And there's a, so they're in the shop to set up the scene. And there's been a, a bit of an ordeal with a, a customer who just wants to buy books based on their looks. And, you know, Aubrey's in a flap about this. Um, and Eli's gone off, who was there, has gone off to help the customer for Aubrey. Um, and so he's just trying to gather his bearings and carry on with the Saturday afternoon. So, before I can escape the front desk, another customer approaches, a young man. He's gorgeous, but never mind that. More important, he has a book in hand. I'm hopeful, a paying customer, thank God. He's dark haired, about my age, stunning actually. There's something very appealing about him and he's attractive in a styled sort of way. Even his hair cooperates, medium length and controlled waves. Clearly he's a man who knows about grooming. Meanwhile, I'm in a rumpled blue shirt and jeans as usual. To my credit, I did drag a comb through my mop of hair this morning, even if I gave shaving a miss. How can I help? I ask. I bought this book last week. American accent, Southern maybe. A leather messenger bag is slung over his shoulder. The way he's holding the book, I can't see the title. The cover is hidden against his trim chest, his hand cradling the spine, a receipt poking out. All right, a sinking feeling hits my stomach. Not a paying customer then. I want a refund. A refund, I frown. He nods, gazing at me in an entirely disconcerting way. It's not helping my mood, even if he is attractive. The author is an asshole, he says, matter of fact. I don't want to support him. Well, a lot of authors are assholes. It tumbles up before I can stop myself. Actually, it's not just writers. Loads of people are assholes. In most economies, they're doing quite well for themselves. Oh, God. He lifts an eyebrow. I want a cash refund. That asshole doesn't need more of my money, especially if the assholes are doing all right, as you say. I sigh. How about store credit instead? I don't do cash refunds. Eli's going to give me a dressing down later if he can hear this. At least the shop's full enough, the bell signaling the comings and goings of customers. At last glimpse, he carried several green books from the classics section. Shop credit's not gonna do me any good back home when I go back in a couple of weeks. I think your policy is, he smirks and his eyes dance, bollocks. That's what you Brits say, right? I start to count to 10. Therapy's caught, taught me the value of taking a minute. What's wrong with the author? I ask reluctantly, already regretting the question. He waves a hand, elegant fingers I can't help but notice, long and lean, something that would be brilliant for a musician. I told you, asshole, he did something on Twitter, he shrugs. Wearily, I rub my face with a hand. I don't like this man, even if he is gorgeous. That's merely a distraction and I won't be swayed. Let me see the book. And social media is best avoided for the record. You should know, I'm, an, I'm a hit on Instagram, he says cheerfully. Of course he is. He hands over the book, a poetry book, secondhand. The author didn't get any royalties from this sale. At least you can take heart in that, I tell him. It'll be me that takes the hit, but I don't wanna share this information with the stranger. I look at the receipt, eight quid. Gritting my teeth, I open the till and retrieve a tenor and slide it him across the counter. Our fingers touch. I snatch mine away as though seared by the sun. I recommend that you stay away from poetry, I say. The ratio of poets to our souls is quite high, alarmingly high, rabble rousers, a lot of them. In fact, it's probably best to just skip anything related to that entire form of literature, just to be safe. That includes prose poems and poetic prose. I stare him down. 
Not only am I a bookseller, but I want to ensure the protection of would-be readers from the ravages of poets. Best keep him away from Bukowski and Baudelaire. This is more than I paid, he says, startled looking at the cash in his hand. Are you sure? I nod once. What's that saying Americans have? The customer's always right. He chews his lip before flashing a grin to rival Eli's. Doesn't help my dark mood. He takes a shop card, glances at it. Is this like the British Barnes and Noble? No, certainly not. Get out. The grin returns, a searing dazzle of bright through the dark of the shop. Quickly, I turn away as my face burns. Never mind him. See you next time. And with that, the door jangles shut behind him. So that is the end of chapter one and the meet cute. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, yeah, I really liked the Barnes and Nobles. Um, <laughs> I liked, I'm sure that was a really fun part of the book to write. Um, so we did have a, a few questions submitted from participants uh, uh, a few days ago. So I just wanted to read those out um, while we're still recording. So the first one was, what was it about the Notting Hill plot that appealed to you? I think it, what appealed to me was like as a Canadian, you know, having been in the UK and sort of seeing things, you know, the contrast between cultures, I thought that was fun. Um, and that was sort of a premise that I really liked about the film as well, like just sort of seeing that, you know, and, and the just total different worlds that they each live in, and a collision of worlds. And that just seemed like a lot of fun. Yeah. And I mean, can't beat Julia Roberts. <laughs> can't beat Julia Roberts. Right? Yeah, it's pretty classic, like that um, first scene, you know, where she goes in and just, you know, um, captures your attention. And I mean, his bookshop, you know, you felt it, you know, once you were there, they did such a great job also in that film with setting, which is why I also wanted to um, make sure I included that. Mm -hmm. Even like it's um, reminding me of You've Got Mail as well, the, the book mm -hmm. that one as well. Um, so they also wanted to know what part of the writing pro or part of the creative process, sorry, did you get the most enjoyment from? I'm always a fan of the first draft and it's probably a controversial opinion. Some people really hate the first draft and they love um, editing. And I love the result of editing. I don't necessarily love editing. But I really, really enjoy the first draft because that's where I'm exploring the story and the characters for the first time and everything is, is new. And it's just fun to see how it all goes, you know? And um, that's, yeah, at, at the very beginning, I'm writing for myself, you know? And so there's just a joy in sitting there and creating it and this world, this story world and meeting everyone for the first time. Yeah, I'm sure it's just like such a fun experience getting to develop, especially if you know what sort of direction you want the story to go in. It's probably just like, you can't wait to get all the information out there. Yeah, I mean, even like the beginning of the story, like uh, my characters, I'm fairly lucky that my characters are fairly well-rounded when they start out, like they just sort of appear. So my main character, I already had a sense of him. And through the story, he goes through a transformation and sort of showing that transformation is fun, you know, and they're like, oh, how am I going to show this? And like I said, just working it out in that first draft is fun. Oh, great. Um, so they also wanted to know, uh, do you base your character, you kind of alluded to this a little earlier, but do you base your characters on people you know, and do they come to you complete, or are they pieces of people in your life that you had just mentioned they were pretty random? Yeah, yeah no, they're not based on anyone I know or any other, you know, pe like any aspects of people that I know or snippets. Like, usually I just have an idea, like, oh, like I wanted yeah, like an introverted bookseller and what would, you know, you know, who enjoys his privacy and his quiet life and this and, and what would be the opposite. And that's how Blake, you know, happened is very like outgoing and social and, you know, uh, relaxed to, you know, Aubrey's stressed out and obviously at the beginning really fussing about all the books. Um, and, and yeah, seeing how they both change in that story is really fun because stories should be about change too. 
And um, so the last question was, uh, where did the title come from? The title, in all honesty, I think came from my editor. Yeah, it had a different title before, which was a working title, which I didn't expect it um, to stay. But I think that they did a great job um, with the titles. And it's actually, it's a lot of work coming up with titles and a lot of back and forth. And um, there's a marketing team as well. And anyway, there's a lot of people weighing in on titles. So it's a big deal. Um, and I had, of course, all kinds of um keywords and themes and stuff and I anyway I feel like this title is really good and at capturing the spirit of the book and um and yeah because my character my main character wasn't looking for love you know at the start of the book he was just grumpy sort of mooning over his ex and then you know what happens like sort of challenges him so and yeah anyway the title I feel like is a good it captures things well yeah, um, and I know I've mentioned to the, you um, this before, but uh, I just really love the cover art as well. I, I've i seen some of the art you've done and um, the artist who made your uh, book cover. It was just, I think that's, if people are going to be um, like some of the characters in the book and um, say that they want a book specifically for the cover and maybe not the contents, I think they're going to, pick the cover and then just fall in love with all the contents of an unexpected kind of love. So oh, yeah, I just want to give a little shout out to. Yeah, and um, yeah, the cover artist just knocked it out of the park and my publisher, like I'm so grateful to them for this amazing stunning cover. And it's actually by, I um, believe it's Mayhem Cover Creations a very talented LJ and um, yeah, like I just love it and it's great. So yeah, I feel very lucky to have this cover that they created. I saw it, you know, the first time and I just, I yelled. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's probably the best reaction they could receive as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you had mentioned you are on Twitter and Instagram. What mm -hmm. it was, what is your handle? Let's see. Um, on Twitter, I believe I'm uh, writer Hayden. And on Instagram, I think it's uh oh Hayden Stone author. Okay. I do have a website and I should have links to all of my social media there. Um, and that is uh, HaydenStoneBooks.com. So we can go there, save me for myself. And there is a page on Facebook. Um, it does, I'm not on it as much as the other two. Um, but that's where you can find me and find out um, updates. And I may start a blog on the website too. So that's something to look forward to um, down the road. Great. And um, so if anybody is interested in purchasing a copy of your book, um, they can do so from your website. Is that um, to find out? The best place is probably even for my publisher's website they've got links to all of the major um, retailers so it's a digital first book um, which means that it is mainly like available through electronic um, retailers so you can find digital versions from you know chapters to of course amazon in, in different countries and Barnes and Noble. Um, the only place you, you can get a paper copy at this time is buying through Amazon. So um, I don't know yet if there will ever be like a broader paper distribution. That's not my sort of decision, but you can get paper copies and I love paper copies, but also love having digital copies. So yeah, um, my publisher has a whole selection of links to some of the usual places, like also co-books, iBooks, co yeah, iBooks. Right. And um, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, if anybody's interested in getting access through um, Vancouver Island Regional Library, you can look at um, our catalog at virl.bc.ca and just look up an unexpected kind of love and then it'll link to Overdrive or if you use the Libby app as well.